Hello everyone, this is Phil Buster Fox once again, this time bringing you something a little different. This is Europa Universalis 3, Divine Wind, the latest expansion. Let me, uh, let me adjust the volume settings here real fast. There we go. You should be able to hear me quite fine now. Anyways, this is EU3, Divine Wind. Uh, EU3 has had a series of expansions, each one adding a lot of features, but I didn't really fall in love with this game until Divine Wind. I always preferred Victoria 2 over it, which is another Paradox grand strategy game, which this is also, much like Hearts of Iron and Crusader Kings, I think, is one as well. So we're going to just jump right in, and I'll explain it as we go. What this is, is uh, it's basically the grand campaign starts in 1399, but you can start at any date, like, say, 1492 or... 1756 and it will adjust the world to how it was at that time more or less you can even adjust it by the day or month if you want to set your own starting date you can set your own year instead of using one of the preset dates but we're going to go right back to 1399 which is my favorite start date it kind of lets you build up from the beginning now this has the entire globe here can i uh, mouse, uh, mouse is better has the entire globe uh, just wraps around like this. Can't really zoom in or out. So uh, it, on the selection here, when you get in game, you can. So, but uh, so you've got the American natives here, Inca and uh, Chimu and such. You've got some uh, African natives, the North African main countries, and of course. Europe, which at this point in time is mostly little minor city-states and stuff throughout the Germanic region. Uh, this is a, roughly at the fall of Byzantium uh, in the 1400s. At this point in 1399, they're down to Thrace and, you know, a little a bit of Greece. The Golden Horde is a current threat at this time period. That's uh, Genghis Khan's buddies. Uh, and most of the currently known nations aren't quite formed yet. Spain is still Castile and Aragon and Granada as well. Uh, France is broken up with Burgundy and plenty of minor duchies and such like that. Ireland is all broken up. England hasn't conquered Scotland. Uh, you know, Denmark, Norway and Sweden are all basically led by Denmark there in a personal union. Teutonic Order still around, so on and so forth. You can worry about what nations are your favorite in this period of history yourself. You've got all the way, uh, in Divine Wind they added a uh, daimyo system for uniting Japan, which I think is really, really fancy, and we'll get into that a bit later. But I'm going to show you basically the basics of EU3 to begin with, uh, because Europe is really where the main game is. I mean, you can play anything, but... Some of them are a little boring, and you're at a real disadvantage. For instance, if you play, say, the Cherokee, uh, you'll just be kind of on your own until Europe comes and colonizes, and you'll be way behind in technology because you get a lot slower, and you'll basically just get owned by them. So it's kind of rough starting outside of Europe or one of the main civilized areas at the time. Uh, how it handles technology and such like this is you've got the Western technology, and then you've got Oriental technology, roughly in this area for like Russia and the Balkans and such, and then you go into the uh, Islamic areas territory or for technology, uh, such as like the Mamluks and such. And then you go to Indian or Indian technology and Chinese technology and the New World technology over with uh, the Americas, and you know, as you go down the scale, it gets harder and harder to research technology. You far, fall further further behind, so you have to gain your technology levels by westernizing, if you can. That's a little more complicated than I should probably go into yet. So we're going to go ahead and start with a uh, uh, Castile in Spain here. I'm going to go ahead and go right in. You can set your settings, difficulties, uh, you can adjust some settings, like you can make spy actions not cost any money, stuff like that. Plenty of options to customize your experience, as well as a console where you can type in whatever code you need it to do, create your own events, it's very moddable, and all these things are very nice. Now, the first thing you'll notice in the main map is, uh, you know, you can zoom in this far, and or zoom out that far, and zoom in 
this close. So plenty of zoom options for whatever you need to do at the time. Uh, generally, you'll find yourself at right about this level, depending on the size of your nation. Uh, sometimes in the larger ones, I usually play, so I can't actually see the armies except as the little flags. And then on the smaller ones, like, if all I controlled was Toledo here, I'd probably be zoomed in about this much, since I don't care what's going on in Germany at this time. All right, uh, you can also set uh, the map to show different uh, overlays, basically. The political map mode which shows the country, very useful one. Most people will be on that constantly. Religious will show you the religious breakdown. Yellow is Catholic. Uh, this kind of orangish is uh, Orthodox. We've got the Muslim, Sunni, and Shiites, and uh, so on and so forth. The Holy Roman Empire is the big dog in Europe at this time period. Uh, granted, it's made up of lots and lots of city-states, but if you piss them off, you tend to piss off more than one of them, and it hurts. It's very painful. They've got a whole system for the Holy Roman Empire, where you've got the emperor and electorates, who will uh, choose the next emperor when the emperor dies, and you can uh, implement reforms and such, but that's complicated. We'll not get into that right now. It's a whole political system right there in the Holy Roman Empire. There's also the papacy, which is yet another political system as you vie for control of the papacy. Even if you aren't the papal states, you can still excommunicate people, uh, call for crusades, that sort of thing, if you've got enough bishops to control the uh, papacy in that situation. Uh, let's see. There's trading. Uh, trade system based around uh, centers of trade. You send merchants out to them and the more merchants you have the more value you get from the trade and you have to compete for a limited number of slots. About 15 or so. 15 or 60. Something like that. Alright. That was a mouthful. So let's actually get into the gameplay, shall we? Let me just set, set up some of my uh, nation settings. There's a bunch of stuff to work with eventually. So let me hire some advisors. I'm not going to go too much into what everything does just gonna show you the game like right now I'm hiring people to uh, improve my technology research and they'll every month they'll basically put much more than I pay them into technology these are the technology sliders uh, it helps to focus specific ones at a time government is a nice one to focus to get your early idea I like that I like stability as a priority first now you've got the treasury one which will allow you to mint money but at, the more you mint, it'll create inflation, which will devalue the currency and make everything more expensive. So you tend to want to avoid uh, inflation whenever you can. So I'm going to prioritize on getting up my stability, and when that's done, it maxes out at plus three. I'm going to go back into government spending. All right, units. As you gain technologies, you'll be able to choose what unit. Like right now, I have the option between Latin Medieval Infantry and the Halberd Infantry. And same with the Latin Knights and Chevalier for uh, uh, cavalry. Uh, we've got artillery that you'll research eventually, and then different ship types, which you can't actually select. You automatically use your best. There are tons of religious decisions based on what religion you are. Uh, decisions are kind of either temporary or permanent changes to how your nation works. For example, with these national decisions, we'll look right here and form a Spanish nation. If I meet all the requirements for it, which you can mouse over and see, I need to own Barcelona, Aragon, and Valencia. So I need to own these three provinces and get cores in them, which I'll go over later. When I have that met, then I can form the Spanish nation, which will give me cores on basically what is historically Spain and give me some other benefits as well. But you have religious decisions, uh, provincial decisions, and national decisions. Also coastal decisions right here uh, where you can get your cultural tradition up. Very complicated. Don't worry if you're not getting everything I'm saying. I'm just kind of covering the bases before I get going. Uh, so this is the government panel here uh, where you can change your government type if you've got the options that you want, like if you want to eventually convert to a republic or some such thing. And uh, sliders here to determine what your uh, government is focused on. For instance, a very easy one to understand is the land and naval one. If you slide it towards land, you gain more benefits for your armies, but your uh, ships and colonists take some hits. If you go towards naval, vice versa. Your ships get cheaper, your colonists get cheaper, uh, but your army isn't as effective. 
And they're all kind of give and take depending on what you want them to do. You can only shift a policy once every 10 years or so, depending on your government, like I can do it every 11.4 years in a feudal monarchy. Spotite monarchy is 13.6. Details aren't important, but for example, I can go towards free subjects right here. When you do that, you've got a chance of three things happening for any decisions. Like you, uh, one third chance of people despairing, losing control, and better administration, which are little events that pop up. Events, when they pop up, will have, you know, some flavor text here. People are disappearing. Since we have made it easier for the peasants to move around in search of better farming opportunities, it has, unfortunately, been more difficult to track them down when the army needs recruits. What that means is, told me here, uh, usually you have one or more options, and uh, depending on how you react to the event will change different things. This one, there's only one option I can get. Madrid will lose some manpower. Manpower, as we slide into that, it's right up here. It, your provinces generate so much monthly and it'll kind of store it up to a maximum and you use that to recruit new troops and replenish uh, damaged regiments for example this regiment has 1,000 soldiers in it if I get in a fight and they're down to 495 I'll have to take from my manpower back into the regiment it does that automatically but it takes time and it takes your manpower so the more manpower the better so I just lost a little manpower for converting to free subjects but it's okay it could be worse all right, I'm just going to go ahead and set up my initial decisions how I like to. Okay, that's it for my magistrates. Select your act. Somebody cost goes up, national tax goes up. I'll wait to do that until my stability comes up. All right, so let's take a stock of what Castile has available at this time. We've got nothing up here. We've got two armies. An 8,000 regiment army, which is 6,000 infantry and 2,000 cavalry. 1,000 uh, infantry in this one as well. And I've got a fleet here which consists of 12 big ships, 2 galleys, and 6 transports. Which are carracks, galleys, and cogs at this point. I have a quick stock to see if I have any generals. I do not, and I don't want to spend that much for a general, so I'm going to go ahead and con convert my ruler to a general. A decent 2 shock, 1 maneuver that improves your troops in battle. I'm going to go ahead and stick him in this bigger army here. And uh, my first mission, which you get over time, is finish the Reconquista. Now, for those, if I, I hope I pronounce that right, my Spanish isn't that great, but the Reconquista is uh, a long period where Lyon, uh, that, that was more of a French way of saying, but Lyon, uh, started expanding against Moroccan and Islamic influence in southern Iberian Peninsula. And as you can see, you know, it came from you know, Lyon in this area, and they kind of pushed and pushed the Muslims out of the Iberian Peninsula in basically a holy war. At this point in 1399, only these three provinces are left for Granada, and you know, Morocco is their ally down there. Obviously, by going to war with them, since they're allied with Morocco, I'll probably end up war with Morocco too, so I'll have to fight them both out of the fights. Now, wars in this work a little differently than a game like Civilization or most other things. Uh, you're based on Cassus Bellies, which are uh, reasons to go to war. For example, I have three available uh, for Granada. I can do Reconquest because I have core territories in their provinces, which I'll get once again into later. Holy War, because they're an enemy religion, I am Catholic, they're Muslim, I must fight them. And Conquest, because I have a mission to capture some provinces from them. So I'm going to go ahead and look at the benefits, decide which. Uh, they'll reduce, like normally, no cast ability will have no special effects in your war. You'll take some stability hit for declaring war without reason, but otherwise it's just regular war. Uh, now, the Cassus Bellies will give you different benefits depending on what they are. Reconquest is for taking your cores back. So you see, it says their conquest of Granada, Almeria, and full annexation get the benefits from this, which is 0% infamy, 100% prestige, and 50% cost. And that means that these two provinces have my cores, which are right here. Gibraltar does not, so I won't get benefit for annexing that, but I will for these two. Uh, and when you annex it, it becomes part of your territory. Flat out. Now, cores uh, are if it belongs to your territory. Like, you f your country decides that that is your land because you've held it long enough or it's meant to you. For instance, if I formed Spain having these 
uh, Navarro would become one of my cores because it's part of historical Spain. But that's beside the point. I do have cores here. Normally it takes 50 years to spread a core. If you conquer a territory and hold it for 50 years, it becomes your core. Uh, if you lose a territory for 50 years, you lose your core. There's some missions and other events that will give you important places, but that's the basic way of doing it. What that means is if you expand too much, you won't have cores. Like, say, I conquer all the way through France and up to Champagne. And uh, I don't have a core in Champagne. That will give me increased revolt risk, all sorts of you know penalties like that. And people who do have core there will have the reconquest cast a spell against me to take it back. A lot of talking. I still haven't unpaused the game and started playing. We'll get to that, I promise. <laughs> but, uh, yes, so I'm going to declare war here to uh, Holy War, Zero Infamy. Okay, Reconquest is going to be the best one here, because I'll get less Infamy. Infamy is bad, we'll just go with that for now. I do. Okay, so I've declared war on Granada. Right now, no one has allies in this war. You can click down here to see the... Uh, general regiments like they have 2,000 troops, I have 9,000, the navy strengths, and the war score. You gain war score by conquering provinces and beating armies, and the more you have, the more you can demand in a peace treaty. So I'm going to go ahead and send my armies to invade their lands there. Now this is a real-time game that you can pause at any time. It's got five speed sliders, so I'm going to go ahead at three speed here, which is obviously the middle speed. All right, Morocco has joined the war, so it shows them in the war now. They're actually the war leader, so if I sue peace with them, I get peace with everyone, whereas I can separate peace with Granada and Morocco is still in the war, because they're not the war leader. I'm talking a little fast for this. I apologize, there's a lot to this, and I'm trying to give a brief look at what it is for some future videos I'll be doing. All right, so my war has begun. My troops should do fairly well because they outnumber and They've got good morale. Hey, I'm the Papal Controller. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pause, show what the Papal Controller does. I can set Crusades, and because I have the largest numbers of uh, bishops, apparently, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call for Crusade against Morocco. What that does is if you're at war with them, you get a buff to your nation. Any time now. Come on. There we go. Oh, no, that's Tunisia joining the war against me. There it is. Okay, Crusade has happened. This uh, puts a modifier to my nation where I get bonus tax, morale, and manpower, and such like that because I'm at war with them and there's a Crusade. So if you go to war with someone with Crusade, you get nice benefits. So it's kind of nice to work with Pope. Pope's a good guy. He's helpful. Unless you're on the other side. All right. So... That'll give you some nice bonuses for this war, which I should lost a battle there. Uh, do fine with. So combat isn't real time or anything. You send your armies together, and they fight depending on uh, variables. Like if I were to cross a river, I'd get a penalty for my army and such like that. All right, that's fine. Let me recruit some more troops. Pause it so I can do this in peace. There we go. Well, not really in peace, but without having to worry about them conquering me. Alright. Won the Battle of Mercia. Mercia. I don't know. I don't know how it's said. I'm just going to say words. I will mispronounce a lot of places in this. Uh, Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and raise war taxes because I can. I'm not even going to explain that. So the goal of the war is to take control of all their provinces uh, by sieging them. After you win the battle against any defender troops, you begin a siege, which uh, will take time. They've got a level 1 fort with a thousand troop garrison there. And I can hit assault at any time to attack the fort, which will try to storm it, kill them, kill me, and if I run out of morale I have to stop attacking, which I will do in this case. And merge up that army. So eventually, you either have to wear down the defenders' morale or the numbers of people. You can keep assaulting until all the defenders are dead, or you can hold your siege until they have to surrender from starvation, that sort of thing. Let me go ahead and speed it up a notch. 
Now, uh, all things considered, the wars are a little strategic as opposed to tactical, like something in the Total War would be a little more tactical, whereas this would be uh, strategic because it's a, the bigger picture sort of thing. You've got to get your troops to the right places with the right supply and such like that. Go ahead and worry down those defenders since I already started. Brittany's off for an alliance. I'm going to ignore them for now because I don't want to go to war with someone who attacks them. Now, if I had any allies I could call, I could call them to join me. I will ally with Scotland. Because the Scots rock. Yeah. Love Scotland. Anyways. So I'm losing this battle here. I'm going to go ahead and... No, no they retreated before I could. And they're going to chase me... Oh, no, they're going back to Granada. Good. Tunisia offering peace. White peace. Are they the leader? No. Okay. I don't care. They can get out of the war. Since Tunisia was not the war leader, because they joined, they weren't as powerful as Morocco, I didn't actually want to go to war with them. And since they offered me a peace where no one got anything out of the deal, I was happy to have them out of the war, so I only have to worry about Morocco and Granada. Come on. Win the siege. Right. So, we're just going to continue on with this little war here. In the meantime, you have to concentrate on your finances. Make sure you're not getting too much infamy or, uh, you know, losing stability, that sort of thing. You've got to manage your nation while you're doing the war, which helps with the slow pace of the battles. There we go. Stability goes up. Let me try another salt here. That should be enough. There we go. I won the siege. You'll see it get some lines across in there. Uh, that means I actually control the province. I can recruit mercenaries out of it, but I can't really do anything else with it until I win it in a peace deal. Right, and then I'll begin the Siege of Granada. Once I siege Gibraltar, I'll be able to annex them completely because they're small enough for that. And there are a lot of rules on how the wars are accomplished, what you can get out of a war. And uh, actually, I'm going to do some royal marriages while I... Oh, no one wants to marry me. I do. Okay. Bye-bye, uh, Papal Influence. I will have an heir. Right, people are buying my stuff. That's good. Stop telling me. New heir. We claim. That's never good. Uh, stop with the pop-ups already. Alright, so... We're just waiting on the war, really. I'll speed it up a little more. Uh, keep an eye on my sieges to make sure I don't get uh, out-sieged somewhere and have to end up sieging that, too. I'll recruit some more soldiers real fast to deal with their little army. There are five of them, so I will make five and then right there. All right. They're winning that siege faster. I've got information up here. You see the 25%, 13%, that's the sieges, so they're... Well, it reaches a 100% chance, there's a good chance that the uh, fort will surrender. So, don't want that to happen before I can get an army there to stop them. In the long run, it won't matter too much if they take the province, but it's never nice to let them do that. Because they'll just take it back before the end of the war, and it'll be fine. Oh, no water. That's unfortunate. Alright, now, while we wait on this war to finish up, I'm going to explain why I'm showing you this. I've uh, just recently gotten into the multiplayer scene for this. This supports up to 32 player multiplayer simultaneously. Now, if you start thinking about the extent of the grand strategy like this, that would be like, uh, I don't know if you've played Total War Shogun's campaign or something, co-op, you know, up to two people playing that. I'd be like having one person for every day meal, except it, it's the whole world. So, you know, you can have an English player, Portuguese player, Castilian player, you know, maybe a player playing the hands of Brandenburg, Sweden, and players everywhere. So it's not just against the AI. And it runs very smoothly. Uh, yeah, some, you know, sometimes the multiplayer will have disconnects or lag or something like that, which happens in any multiplayer game, really. But, like, compared to something like Civilization, which also gets out-of-sync errors and stuff like that, but the later you go, the slower the turns take, and it 
takes like a minute and a half to finish a turn. I love the game, but that is really unreasonable. Let me go ahead and fix my tech sliders here. The stability is finished. No. Stupid mouse. My mouse is turning to double click when I single click. It's getting old. I wear asses out pretty fast. Mice. Whatever. M Moisa. And there we go. One to go. Japan discovered by Portugal. Good for them. Not so good for me. Doesn't matter though. It's too far away to do anything yet. I don't have colonial empires or anything. No, I don't want partial conquest. I want it all. Yes, delicious. All of your territory. Must finish the Reconquista. Where are they running to? Granada? Of course they would run to Granada and not Gibraltar. All right. So I'm going to have my second army chase down their army while my large army finishes with a conquest of their territory. Save my territory, it's all good. I'm going to win this war handily. Then I'll have to deal with Morocco, at least get them to sue for peace or maybe take some of their land if I feel like it. But uh, I don't want to overextend too soon. It'll build up my infamy and it will uh, give me more revolt chance. Like right now I've got no revolt chance because these are all my provinces. When I take this, there's Sunni territory, which will give me some religious revolt chance. Uh, you know, this one will have nationalists because it's not my core. It's kind of rough just taking territories at will. Eventually you overextend so much that your army spend more time fighting rebels than they do enemy armies. So it's a big pain in there, especially for like a horde. But that's not important right now. Oh, I have a lot of money. Why do I have so much money? Oh, right, war taxes. Yay, war taxes. <laughs> Sweet. Oh, have I been... Oh, I haven't been stocking my trade. Let's, uh, let's send... Auto send merchants. There's a lot to keep track of in this game, and when you get later... Like, for example, when you get to the colonization period, I'll have territory in the Americas, I'll have territory in Africa, territory in Asia, and it gets really complex with revolts popping up in some of the territories. You'll be at war with like four or five nations and different, you know, spheres of the globe. Or not spheres, but, uh, uh, well, whatever. <laughs> different areas of the globe. Like, I'll be fighting India and Russia. Indian and Asia, and uh, I'll be fighting the Aztecs in America, that sort of thing. No, okay. So I've completely conquered all the territory. That gives me a 100% war score against them. You know, my war score is only 29% because I haven't touched Morocco yet. But fortunately, if I talk just to Granada, 100% with them. I'm just going to go ahead and annex them completely. You can either demand tribute for specific things, make them break treaties, become your vassal, that sort of thing. But I am just going to take everything. Now, because I didn't have a core there, I did pick up four infamy, and uh, I got 15 prestige for conquering them, which is nice. Alright, now I have to find a way to get Morocco out of the war. First, I'm going to see uh, what my mission is. Okay, my mission does not involve conquering any of that. They will not accept white peace, so I'm just going to have to invade. What a pity. I've got six transports, so I can only send six across at a time. That is alright. One, two, three, four, five, six. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, you hit me today. Alright, and I will start invading their land. Oh, shit, that was inflation. Oh. Inflation's bad. Now, as soon as I start landing here, I stand the chance to run face first into their armies. So, this could turn out very badly for me. Fortunately, I'm pretty secure up here because right now I'm not at war with anyone else. I don't have to worry about keeping a large army here. I can just kind of send my entire force down and to deal with Morocco.
Oh, shoot, 10. Gotta reinforce them. <coughs> Alright. Oh, wow, that army is losing so much. See if they'll take peace now because I really don't want to fight this war right now. My army's losing. Oh, that is very bad. Alright, so I will reinforce them. No, they're going to annihilate that army. But I won't have much answer to their army. Alright, so I went over a little prematurely. Didn't have nearly enough forces for that. Looks like they're running to the ships, so that's... Oh, shoot, only one of them is. What's your peace offer? Oh, 470... No, screw you. I will build another army before I pay you that much. Aragon has warned me not to start a war. Good for them. Don't care. Come on. Actually, click it. Thank you, FF. Let's work on some mouse accuracy. This is why you don't play StarCraft anymore. What's the marcher? <laughs> Just randomly in there. If you conquer enemy territories, you can actually recruit their units until it becomes your core. Oh, and also you can rename your territories. For instance, if, for instance, uh, if I want to name uh, Galatia Equestria. Pow! It'll change it. You can even name the cap rename the capital province in there. Bam. There. Equestria with the capital canter lot. And you can do that for any provinces you want. It works in multiplayer too, so you'll be able to see each other's provinces. You can rename your armies the same sort of way. Army one. See? And then you'll be able to find it easily in your uh, little drop down thing there should the need arise. Fourteen ships. Am I gonna win that? Twelve oh two six. Yeah I should win that. Naval battles are the same thing as land battles basically. It's just this little thing that's not that interesting to watch. Because you shouldn't be watching it anyways, there's way too much other stuff to be doing when you're fighting battles than to just watch to see how your battle is doing. It's important to check, in case you need to run away or something, but you really just don't want to be stuck doing that. Alright, six, I want to move on to that, but I have to wait for that ma naval battle to be done. Armies down there. I lost. Did I turn down my maintenance? No, my maintenance is fine. Okay, well my ships just suck. <laughs> Gotta love when your army just refused to. Twelve hundred. Oh, that was from the old. That was the old army. Not much left of them. there. Alright, well I'll wait for my fleet to be repaired and then I'll send them back out. Hey, I'm the palpable controller again. You can also excommunicate, excommunicate people, like uh, if I wanted to have a reason to go to war with them all the time. Of course they have to have poor relations with the papal state, but I'm okay. So, there we go. Keep your fleet away. Let me land in your province. You won the wars anyways. Now, I would like to point out the wars are not the most interesting part of this game. Can I sue for peace yet? 
really it's the diplomacy and how just anything can happen. You can end up with, say, uh, Broy being the major power in Europe. It's not likely, but it can happen. Especially if you're playing as it, not the uh, computer. And make friends with Burgundy. Oh, my army's so bad. Oh shit, no, no, oh, no, my army. Just annihilated them by doing that. Okay, I'm tired of losing this. Sue for peace. Tribute. Concede defeat. No? Okay, well, I'll just... I'll just defend them. Let's see you land on my territory. Eventually, they'll get bored and peace up. Can't believe I'm doing this badly. It's normally not that hard. I did a poor job. Oh, they already landed on my territory. Who knows? I'm losing to Morocco. I gotta do something about that fleet then. Alright, oh my goodness, my, oh, my armies are getting beaten in every turn. Okay, my army's building again. So you might be able to see how things can quickly go badly for you in a game like this. If your army is defeated, you have to spend your time managing your remaining forces as well as trying to rebuild your armies while they're sieging your territories and making a general nuisance of themselves. Uh, interestingly, in the multiplayer, you can actually share control of a nation, which helps with large empires and such. I thought that was kind of neat when I uh, tried it out for the first time yesterday. There we go. Should go better. No, they just get to run away. It's good music, too, I, I have to say. I like it. Get some fleet repairs in. There we go. Do the same thing to them that they did to me. Knock them out of our territory. Guess we'll become defender of the faith. <laughs> so much money. Still landing. Nope, still won't accept my piece. Hate copying the mic like that, but oh hey, all right. So I got teched up here. I got my government level four. Good, switch to land. Yep. Now what that allowed me to get is a new national idea. You know, one second. Sorry. All right. So uh, 
you can select one of these per idea that you get up to um, 12. <laughs> it's hard math. 12 in the late game. Uh, these last three columns you unlock with higher levels of tech, like that requires the naval tech 7, trade tech 7, so on and so forth. Anyways, these allow you to uh, give your nation a specific bonus. For instance, this one will give you a 33% extra colonial growth. Uh, this will give you extra army tradition yearly, that sort of thing. Uh, I think I would like the inflation reduction, because inflation is bad. That is always nice to have. That will reduce what my minting will create inflation-wise. Right, cool. Now if I uh, actually had a... Let's do some of these. There we go. We get an inflation reduction advisor. One. Yeah, screw you. I don't want him. Alright. Sorry. <laughs> Back to what I was doing. Didn't I have an army there? Oh well. Attack their navy again. This war is kind of a stalemate. I attack him, my armies will get killed. He attacks me, his armies will get killed. It's kind of taking advantage of whoever's armies was killed last, or until war exhaustion takes its toll. Mine's rising much more quickly because I'm using uh, war taxes, but... Conversely, I should be doing a lot better in this war, so... Uh, Almera. Okay. Alright, anyways. That's enough of this war. You'll see wars are happening. This is occupied by rebels. England is at war with uh, France and all of its vassals, so on and so forth. The uh, Golden Horn are attacking up in uh, Smolensk. How did that get released? That's interesting. All right. Anyways, every time you play, the map will just play on its own, so the same things don't happen. Similar things tend to happen because uh, nations will generally go in their historical routes. That's, the AI will like get a mission. For example, England has a mission to uh, uh, recover Normandy from France. So they've got to take Normandy right here from France. So they'll go to war with France to try to take it. And that will kind of develop how the nation will expand, but unexpected things will happen that didn't happen in history. For example, uh, the Teutonic Order could conquer all of Russia. It's not likely to happen, but it can happen. But that's beside the point. I want to show you a couple of the other uh, special things in this fairly long video here. Uh, primarily the Japanese Shogunate system. Which I enjoy. Alright, so this is Japan, it's split into four shogunates and then the imperial city of Kyoto, which you can technically play, but don't because it actually cannot do anything at all. Nothing. <laughs> it is a waste of time to play. Uh, the daimyos cannot make foreign policy. They can only have uh, diplomacy with other daimyos. Kyoto is who makes the, like they can declare war on Korea and such like that. But have no way of actually waging the war. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I could actually do that when I play it as Japan. I think only the AI can do it, but I'm not sure. Anyways, the general goal of the Shogunate system is Japan is to unite Japan under your rule. For instance, I am the purple Fujiwara here. Tiara, Minamoto, and Tachibana. This is Shogunate window, kind of like the Papsi had a window and the uh, Holy Roman Empire had a window. Uh, right now, Minamoto is Shogun. They're in the best position to unite Japan, but in order to do so, you have to be the only daimyo uh, remaining unless you are uh, the not the Shogun, in which case you can do it if you're at war with the Shogun, and uh, they don't actually control any of their territory. What? Oh. Whatever. I'm not really sure on that. It's it's poorly worded. It's used. They word things in uh, like programming logic. 
So if you if you've ever programmed before, you should get it fine. Like uh, you have to be at war. You have to have less than three daimyos, and Fujiwara it has to be the Shogun, and you have to be at war with Fujiwara. Oh, any country is at war with you, then Fujiwara has to have its own. I don't even know. I can't figure that one out. But that's not the point. I want to get the Shogun and do it the right way. So, in order to do that, I have to weaken the current Shogun, who's got an influence of 61. You can see there, you can see there. Uh, in order to do that, you can send diplomats to Kyoto to do that, uh, but you have to have enough prestige to do it, uh, which you earn from winning battles and taking territories and such. Uh, alternately, you can just uh, wait until their influence weakens by beating them in battles, that sort of thing. One thing I like to do in Japan is to ally with the guy on the opposite side of Tiara for me, if I'm not Tiara. Uh, Tyra, whatever. I don't know. I form an alliance with them, for example, and uh, then I gang up on the guy in the middle. We both take his territories, and I'll deal with my friends later after I've knocked everyone else down, and I can become Shogun. But, uh, so that's just a quick look at the Shogun system. Uh, once the Shogun is removed, you can become Kem Puku, Kempaku, something like that. And then from there, you have to go to war with everyone and make them recognize you as Shogun. It's a very long process of civil war in order to unite Japan, but when you do, you've got a pretty solid nation that's fairly safe from invasion because it's a nice island power, kind of like England. Alright, and that is how that system works. Ming also got a new system in Divine Wind with the factions. Not too fond of it, actually. It had the potential to be interesting, it just isn't, and it pisses you off. So, you've got the faction control of the Celestial Empire here. Uh, the Eunuch Faction, Temple Faction, Bureaucratic Faction. Whichever one has the highest influence is the one in power, and it restricts you from doing certain things. For example, right now the Eunuch Faction is in power with 91% influence. And that means I cannot build buildings, I cannot send missionaries, I cannot declare war, and I cannot build over the force limit for uh, armies and navies. My land force limit is also reduced by 60%. The temple faction actually allows me to declare war, but I can't build colonies, I can't build buildings, I can't send merchants, I can't build over the force limit, and both force limits, naval and land, are reduced by 60%. Force limit is uh, kind of a soft cap for the number of troops you can have. For example, I look at my military thing here. I have a support limit of 42 and a support limit of 60 for land and navy respectively. If I go over that, I pay extra fees for having that army. In the case of a lot of these factions, I can't go over it at all. Much like I can't, currently can't declare war and conquer territories. I have to wait for people to declare war on me or something like that to happen. Uh, Unfortunately, that makes for a pretty restrictive game, because if you want to declare war, then, for instance, I can't colonize Taiwan, or the Horde Territories, or build structures. I mean, it's fairly annoying, and you uh, get faction power based on uh, who your ruler is, and what your sliders are set to. Remember these sliders for the uh, this? For instance, the eunuchs like uh, naval and or uh, naval and uh, free trade, and I don't have those, so they're going to lose a lot of influence really fast. Alright, and that's the other unique... Uh, well, there's one more unique system I'll quick show you. And that is the hordes, which are kind of fun and kind of infuriating to play at the same time. Uh, like the Golden Horde here, for example. Now, hordes have lots of territories and huge armies, like I've got 68,000 guys just in these two territories right here. They start at war with pretty much anyone bordering them, and they have very easy ways of winning these wars. They cannot make peace except in two ways, uh, or three ways, I think. You can uh, submit or concede defeat, which gives your opponent some prestige and it costs you some legitimacy and stuff. Uh, you can do that either way. They can concede defeat and get peace, or you can. 
and uh, as a horde. Uh, then there's tribute, which you pay them for a while. Generally, a horde will conquer your nation and be like, you pay me, or I'm just not going to leave your nation. So then you pay them like four ducats per month, and that gives the horde some money to continue their conquests, as well as kind of screwing the economy of whoever has to pay it. Finally, you can vassalize them, which basically force them to be your ally and do whatever you want them to. Now, the downside of hordes is whenever your ruler dies, even if you have an heir, you enter a secession crisis, which means that a large group of rebels will spawn in one of your provinces, and, and in every one of your provinces that isn't a core. And if you've been expanding, every province you take is not the core. Now, the interesting thing I want to show you about how they fight wars is uh, twofold. First, I'm going to go ahead and conquer Moldavia here. Very easily, because I have gigantic armies and they've got 3,000 guys. Each, uh, each number there is 1,000, so that's 3,000, that's 31,000. And every city you conquer gives you prestige and legitimacy and stuff, it's great. Gone. Okay, so I've conquered this province, it's occupied. I can't do anything with it. Uh, and now, after a certain amount of time, eventually the province will just surrender and join the horde. So, uh, go ahead and move my army up towards Poland to keep them out. We'll just turn up the speed and watch as this process happens. Now, Horde's main disadvantage is they get very, very poor tech, and they fall behind quick. Well, I don't really care about my other territories, I just want to show you how this works. Now, while we're waiting on this, uh, when they conquer territory, they're able to send colonists, which you get over time, up to a max of five, to your territories, and if they get a thousand people at like 200 per colonist, so they send five colonists, uh, they get the territory without having to win it in a peace deal, and that's how uh, territories are traded from the hordes. Much like they collect them by controlling them for some time, they eventually just flip to the horde, which I'm hoping you'll see sometime soon. Uh, they have to colonize it to take it back. As I said, I don't really care that my nation is dying, or I do a much better job of defending this, but I just want these two provinces to stay under my control, and that is all I care about right now. Somebody pop-ups. I didn't even dump my sliders or anything. There we go, there it goes. Okay, so they've been pillaged into submission and wrestled for more dog. Yeah. Moldavia. So this is actually my territory now. And now as a result, I've discovered Transylvania, and if I'm not already at war with them, I will be shortly. Not oh, there it is. I'm in Transylvania. So I can attack them now too. And that is how you expand. However, it does not give you a core until 50 years after you conquer it. So when my uh, leader dies, there will be rebels in, the, rebels in that province. And if I were to like conquer six provinces there, there would be rebels in all of those provinces. And that gets to be a huge pain to deal with. Especially since I'm at war with everyone, so I'm being attacked on all fronts. Alright, so that's how hordes work. Very cool. Very different. So, if you get bored with, say, playing England and conquering Europe, you can play the Horde, or you can go play Ming, or Japan, or, uh, or Ethiopia. Swahili. Just basically the further you get from Europe, the slower you get technology, and when Europe starts colonizing, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Unless you westernize it, westernize fast. Alright, this has been Europo Universalis 3. Sorry that it's such a long video. I didn't mean to go on this long, but there's a lot to cover and I kind of showed everything. Thanks for sticking through it. What's going to happen next for this, since you've waited all the time to the end of the video to find out what's really going on, why I'm doing this video, I'm, this weekend I'm going to be participating in some multiplayer games. And, 
and one Saturday I'll be playing as Morocco, and the next one, I don't know what I'll be playing yet, maybe India, who knows, but uh, I'll, I'll be doing uh, less sequenced videos like this where I showed everything. I might occasionally turn it off for a while and nothing's happening and it's boring, uh, but uh, that way you can kind of follow the story of how my empire expands, declines, and collapses, because that's what's inevitably going to happen. I'll go ahead and give you a sneak peek at the game for Saturday. Uh, I got the save game from the last session. I've just joined it. It's been going. I'm going to join the late here. Uh, yes, this is it. No, 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 this one is it. All right. So you look at Europe. Hansa's got most of North Germany. Teutonic Order controls what's Prussia, basically. And uh, Austria's got southern Germany and Austria and Hungary. Golden Horde's kind of been pushed back by Moscow, but is wedged into lower Europe. France is mostly unified. Spain has become Spain. It's already colonizing some. It's got a territory there. Holland's been there. England's there. So the Native Americans are in trouble. Uh, let's see. There's some Spain down there. India's grown up nice and big. Almost ready to unify. Minamoto hasn't unified Japan yet, but he's conquered most of Manchu, which is kind of impressive. I must have gone to war with Kyoto for him to do that. Uh, let's see. Byzantium completely destroyed the Ottomans ahistorically and has taken what should be theirs as well as South Italy. Very interesting, but I'll be playing Morocco here. Uh, my main threats are Portugal and Spain because... Uh, they historically kind of mess with Morocco, but Spain's got that one territory of mine, and I think since he's concentrating on colonialism, if I leave him alone, I'll probably be left alone, so I'll probably end up conquering Algiers and Tunisia, and maybe retaking this province, and then uh, colonizing what I can in North Africa, maybe conquering these people and taking all their lands too, and trying to make a living doing trade that way. Might not be exciting, but it might be. Uh, the other game I'm going to play Sunday is the save. And uh, so you see how Poland's the major power in Germany. This is a different year. This is a little earlier. 1472 is the first one. This one's 1456. England's pretty well united there. They're about to become Great Britain, no doubt. Portugal's a one over Castile, so they're looking to form Spain there. See, Morocco's got a big chunk of Algiers in it, but uh, all things considered, it's doing pretty well. Mamluks and Ottomans are major powers here. Uh, this is India, which I probably will end up playing in this, although I might go to Japan. Japan is very not unified. It is a big mess for all four Damias right now. It'd be very interesting if I went there, I have to admit. And uh, there are a few other options for me to go. I haven't really decided yet. Uh, most of the powers are taken, but if you're watching this and you want to see me play a particular power in the other one, I think Sicily is available. I could play that. Uh, I could play Switzerland, but that would be really, really bad for me. I would just die to France, basically. Uh, India, which is in pretty good shape, but, uh, almost ready, well, Virginia and Niagara, almost ready to form Hindustan, but, uh not quite. It's, it's going to have a bit of a slow start. Uh, I would probably go Fujiwara if I went to Japan. One, because I like Turbo, and two, because I think they're in the best position as it is. And, uh, you know, then I can easily colonize this island here, but I might go there. So if you want to see me play someone in particular, go ahead and post a comment for me, uh, because I can't decide. Just keep in mind that uh, this will be Sunday, so I'll probably decide within a couple of days. So if, if you don't post it soon, I, it, it'll be too late to matter. Or I could go Shawnee and lose. <laughs> Alright, so this has been EU3. I'm looking forward to posting up some of the multiplayer games to let you guys have a look at what's going on there. And uh, this has been Filibuster Fox, and thank you for watching.